Okay, well, good afternoon. My name is Hadley German and I am the Eugene B. Adkins Curator here at the Fred Jones Junior Museum of Art. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you to our second Zoom program held in conjunction with the exhibition OKLA. OK Before we get started, we have a little bit of housekeeping. We have muted all of your microphones, but we have two ways for you to communicate with us today. That's through the chat box and the Q&A box. If you have any technical difficulties or if you have a comment for the entire group, we ask that you would please type that into the chat box. If you have a question specifically for our speaker, please type that question into the Q&A box. Our speaker will respond to your questions during a Q&A session at the end of the program. However, at any point today, you can enter questions into the chat box or the Q&A box. You don't have to wait till the end. So without further ado, I am pleased to introduce you to our guest speaker. Catherine Ware is the Curator of Photography at the New Mexico Museum of Art in Santa Fe. Prior to joining the museum in 2008, she worked at a number of major institutions, including the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the J. Paul Getty Museum, and the Oakland Museum. Specializing primarily in American and European photography of the early 20th century, she has organized solo exhibitions on historic figures, including Laszlo Maholy Nagy and Man Ray, written about the history of the Julian Levy Gallery in New York, and worked on subjects as diverse as low riders and environmentalism. She is currently researching mixed media photography of the 1960s and 70s for a future exhibition. We're so fortunate to have Kate join us today to speak about one of the six artists at o Oklahoma expatriates featured in OKLA, the photographer Jerry McMillan. So please join me in a warm Zoom welcome for Kate Ware. Thank you so much, Hadley. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you great. Great, great. Well, I really appreciate this opportunity to talk about one of my photo heroes. And it's been such a pleasure to work with you and the staff. So I'm grateful for that. And thanks to uh, Dr. Mark White for matchmaking us. Um, let's see, I, um, I decided to call the talk today, Looking for More. So you will see at the right, a self-portrait by Jerry McMillan from 1978 that's in the exhibition. And um, the first thing you probably notice is it doesn't really look like a photograph. So hold that thought. That's something that we're really gonna be talking about that's very emblematic of his work. Um, and uh, I did just want to mention housekeeping wise, I used images not only from the show, but some from the internet. And so some of the captions are not standardized. I decided to just not, not try to mess with that. Um, so um, they'll be accurate, but, uh, but diverse. And also big thanks. I, my comments today will rely some on the research of Mark White and Mary Statzer two colleagues who are both now in New Mexico, which is marvelous, and also on my conversations with the artist himself. So first let's start and just talk a little bit about Jerry's background. Uh, he was born in Oklahoma City in 1936, and by the 50s, he was in high school at class and high with his friends, Joe Good and Ed Ruscha in art classes together. And according to Ruscha, um, Joe and Jerry were rather lively students. <laughs> and <laughs> he specifically cites small sculptures that were set on fire and little balls of clay being thrown out the window. So uh, <laughs> with, with that kind of fun, who wouldn't want to become an artist when they grow up? And indeed, Ruscha had uh, convinced them by 1958 to re relocate to Los Angeles to attend Chouinard Art Institute. And that's where Jerry gravitated toward photography. He was self-taught because uh, many places weren't teaching photography as a fine art at that time. Chouinard certainly wasn't. It was a lot more uncommon than it is now. So he was there from uh, 1958 to 1960 and lived together with his friends 
from Oklahoma City in a house in Hollywood where they had a dark room. And to the left there, you see a, a picture of Jerry uh, just a couple of years after he graduated. And he's photographing his friend, uh, Maurice Yanez, and Maurice is photographing him. So it's kind of got this great picture within a picture quality. Well, here is the group uh, who called themselves Students Five. If you're counting, there is someone missing. Um, but one of these pictures is in the show, the one on the right, uh, which is also on the cover of the exhibition catalog, which I highly recommend to you. It's a rip, snort, and good read. Uh, great story, great characters, and uh, ostensibly all true. So uh, if you're not able to see the show, which of course I also recommend, uh, I, do, I do really think you would enjoy the catalog. It's got, it's got all the pictures and all the good, all the good info. So, um, of course, photography is a medium of multiples. It's not unusual to see more than one shot from a session. Um, but I pulled this other piece, uh, this other image on the left off the internet because I wanted to really make the point that here we see them really thinking about how they want to present themselves. That's a couple of different setups, a couple of different poses, and um, you know, just deciding how they want the world to see them. And that was one of the great things about moving to Los Angeles. It was nowheresville in terms of the art world. Um, you know, they were free of whatever strictures came with their home communities. And uh, as it has been for a lot of people, it's a place where you can decide who to be to some extent. So the pictures were taken by Patrick Blackwell and Patrick was the only one of the gang who really had any training in photography. He learned about it in the Navy. So when he got back, he was really the go-to guy for any technical concerns and you know, kind of consulted with everybody. They were all interested in photography, although uh, Jerry was really the one who uh, took it up most seriously and pursued it. Um, so on the left, it, it, you almost see it's almost it's almost like a nice organized, compositionally strong album cover, right? You've got the guys in the band, you've got the paintings behind them, which are um, look like abstract expressionism, um, something they would soon reject, um, but they're all very serious and and looking at the camera. Whereas the picture on the right <coughs> is. Um, they're hunkered down together and it's cropped. So they're kind of zooming in on, <clears throat> pardon me, the, the people and giving less of the background. <clears throat> and uh, they're all engaged in some kind of debate or conversation. Um, it, and it's just, it's much livelier and it shows more the materials of art making rather than the results of art making. Uh, so honestly, I think um, this could be a really good candidate or a caption contest. <laughs> but we will leave that aside for now and continue ever onward. So Jerry got an opportunity in 1961 to uh, make a photograph uh, for an exhibition announcement, a poster for um, Henry Hopkins Gallery on La Cienega. And they were doing a show called War Babies. And uh, I think Joe Good was uh, an organizer or was, was part of organizing the show as well as being in it. Um, all of the, the four artists were all born before World War II. So that was part of their life. That was part of their lives and part of the reason for uh, the title. Uh, they all were... Um, also, uh, it, it was a very volatile time politically. So, of course, the, we know that about the 1960s, but specifically in 1960, uh, the House on an American Activities Committee was doing hearings in San Francisco um, to um, investigate alleged communist subversion. And the protests against the hearings erupted into a, a huge riot. And then, of course, a couple of years later, uh, by, by uh, 1964, the, the free speech movement was in full bloom in Berkeley. So just to remind you of, of some of that climate. So, um, <clears throat> so here, 
the uh, Jerry and, and probably Joe decided to arrange the four artists in the show around a table. And each of them is holding some kind of a, a food or, or food item that's uh, a stereotypical, stereotypical of uh, each of their cultural or racial identities. So that's pretty edgy to begin with <laughs> for the war babies. And so <clears throat> but if, if that wasn't pushing the boundaries of good taste enough, they decided to use an American flag as the tablecloth. And uh, Jerry has a long story about trying to get a flag and, you know, was able to get it cheaper because it only had 48 stars. And uh, so they, but they really wanted to, um, to have that be the tablecloth. And a couple of the artists were doing, um, the, the, were taking on subject matter that critiqued contemporary politics, um, racial stereotypes, and the brutality of war. So that was kind of part of the whole mix as well. And uh, the um, this kind of setup refers to some of that sensitive subject matter as well in a really blatant way. So <clears throat> this really transgressive image and uh, the, gallery, the, the donors backing the gallery were really nervous. They, they were very uncomfortable and it, uh, the poster garnered a lot of attention, a lot more attention than the show itself, to be honest. And <clears throat> you see none of the artist's names are on the announcement, uh, nor is it attributed to Jerry McMillan, um, but it is one of his very famous images because of that context and in, uh, the gallery did close after after this exhibition. So if, if that's not radical, I don't know what it is. <laughs> um, <clears throat> let's see, was there anything else I was gonna say about that? Well, Kara, let's carry on to the next. So I, I talked a little bit about Jerry <clears throat> having a really important role in projecting the identity of some of the young artists at the time. And on the left is a picture he did with Patrick Blackwell. And Patrick was looking for a position in the advertising world. And so here they've got him looking exceedingly dapper, perched on this stool and ready for action. And I love that all around him, there's this cacophony of uh, visual detritus and you know images and letters of the alphabet. And you know it just feels like he's bursting with ideas. So it, to me, that feels like, like a very effective uh, way of picturing him. And I really love that <clears throat> around the studio, there are these crumpled pieces of paper, like discarded ideas or, you know, first drafts that didn't work. And, you know, he just looks like a creative genius. And um, it, it, the ploy certainly worked, um, along with his talents, of course. And uh, he did get a job as uh, director of the advertising firm, uh, Carson and Roberts. I'm gonna, I've got a little bit of a throat thing going on here. <clears throat> Pardon me. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Ah, next to him is a portrait of another Oklahoma friend, the multi-talented Mason Williams. And Williams was in Los Angeles doing a variety of things. Um, he was working as a musician, as a comedian, as a writer. He really, uh, he really had a great range. And uh, this is just, this picture just delights me. Um, Jerry McMillan has him standing um, in the middle of 7th Street, which unaccountably has no traffic. Um, and so there he stands, stock still, gazing upward and just picking out a tune. Um, and uh, and uh, the photographer runs that double line from the middle of the street right down the middle of the composition and, and into our laps. So it really draws us into the composition. There's kind of like an on-ramp uh, to, uh, to being part of this, this scene. And uh, I don't know, my gosh, if, if Los Angeles really was like this, you know, maybe I'd still be there. I think um, one of the great things too is that it's, it's um, an unmanipulated picture. It's a man standing in the street, um, but it really, just creates this world and this this um, just sense of fun that's really characteristic of his work. Uh, I could not resist including this charming and engaging 
portrait that Jerry made of, of Ed Ruscha, and he photographed Ruscha quite a, quite a few times and under many different circumstances. But if this indeed is meant to promote an artist and his books, he is using the minimal required elements to make that message. And I love that simplicity. Uh, so you've got Ruscha standing there with some of his artist books on his head. And instead of having them be on a table or on a bookshelf or in his hands, he's got them balanced on his head, which of course is where they came from initially. And um, some of you may be familiar with these books. There's some in the show and uh, they're just, they're, I find them just so marvelous. They, they meant so much to me as a student. And uh, I remember being in, in La Jolla in the gift shop and the, you know, there were some of the books that were for sale. And I, gosh, I think they were $20 and I just couldn't do it. But um, I can't believe I didn't make that happen. I just, I just find them so delightful. And uh, of course, a lot of them do engage with, uh, with photography quite a bit. And uh, I did just wanna say that as, as I kind of alluded to a little bit in the last image there, there's this dry wit, they're kind of deadpan images, um, and these are qualities of work that Jerry shares with his Oklahoma homies. They really have a sense of consistent vision, and um, Mark White talks about this in the catalog uh, to some extent that, you know, even though they were very disparate figures as artists, they had, they had their, each had their own vision, and um, but that there was this kind of shared quality of wit and anti-authoritarianism, uh, confounding expectations, and absolutely subverting boundaries. So that was some, that's something that you really see in, in all of the artists' work. This is something that's not in the show. I just wanted to bring this into the conversation just to show that Jerry worked with a variety of artists. And um, in, in here he's working with um, Judy Cohen from Illinois. And uh, so Judy was in LA as an artist and had a solo show coming up at Cal, I think it was Cal State Fullerton. And so she needed a, a promo image and Jerry worked with her on that. And um, she was also launching herself with a new name, Judy Chicago. So Jerry, um, oh, well, Judy was affiliated with uh, a group of artists at the Ferris Gallery on La Cienega in kind of the heart of uh, the, the happening contemporary uh, gallery scene in Los Angeles at the time. And it was really a very um, testosterone heavy environment. <laughs> and Judy really felt like she was fighting for her place. It, in the art world and in that group as well. So she and Macmillan decided to stage this picture in a boxing ring, which took a fair amount of logistics and you know, getting, getting uh, permission to use it. And uh, her dealer had uh, these sweatshirts printed with, with her new name on it. And the idea was really just to um, kind of poke fun at the machismo of the art world and, and the artists in that in that uh, particular gallery stable at the time. And of course it was uh, essentially the beginning, this is 1970, I think, yeah, the beginning of uh, the women's movement. And um, so it was also, it, it became a very emblematic picture uh, for her. And people would come up and ask her uh, if, if she wanted to box with them and it, it had enough of a life that a few years ago, um, I think it, it was 2018, the New York Times mag style magazine was doing an article about Judy and they restaged this picture um, with uh, Collier Shore making kind of a, an updated version of it. So it's, uh, it's really a very iconic image of, uh, of some of these young artists that he made. And um, I forgot to mention when he was doing the show for the, um, the Heisman Gallery, um, the War Baby show, he also did individual portraits of those artists. And um, um, Hopkins said that he could uh, show those on the mezzanine. So that was a great opportunity for him to show that work. But, but those portraits uh, have just been used again and again over the years. 
as uh, you know, kind of encapsulations of those art, those artists in, in their young years at the beginning of their careers. Well, let's step back for a minute and talk about the photography world in a broader sense. Uh, and uh, so. Uh, Jerry says that he really didn't know any photographers other than his friend Max. Uh, um, um, did I, was it Max? What did I say? Maurice, excuse me. Yeah, and who we saw in the uh, early slide, and he didn't have any awareness of the photo community, but he was part of this broader uh, art community, obviously, with his friends and housemates and uh, some of the galleries that he was affiliated with. Um, but, uh, so he had his own, um, kind of self-taught take on photography. He, he hadn't drunk the Kool-Aid as it were. He didn't have, he wasn't restricted by some of the training and some of the, so the sense of art history. Uh, so he was pretty open to things. Well, one of the touchstones that he talks about was the exhibition, The Family of Man, which some of you may know about or have seen the book. It, it's pretty ubiquitous. It's still pretty ubiquitous. So this was a show organized by Edward Steichen for the Museum of Modern Art in New York in 1955. It was a huge show of international photographers that included uh, work by Eugene Smith, um, Henri Cartier-Bresson, Dorothea Lange, a lot of big names, and uh, really was became kind of a, a manifesto for <laughs> excuse me, peace and equality in, uh, in the aftermath of World War II. So some people just loved it to pieces and other people loathed it to pieces. And, um, you know, it just really got, had, had a very long, a long life in the art world. So, um, but Jerry says that um, about 10 years later, apparently MoMA was doing another show uh, kind of an, uh, another survey, and they put out a call for entries, um, and he, he sent in some work, um, which came in too late, so he didn't really have the option to be in it, but they were going to do a publication, and so he was so excited uh, that um, to, to really see what had happened in 10 years, you know, from this, what, what now many of us view as kind of sentimental, maybe kind of homogenous, images as you see at the left um but, but you know how had photography developed so he was really just waiting and on tenter hooks to, to see this new publication and um when it came out he he was really upset because the pictures looked a lot like the pictures on the family of man not much was different people wanted the same kind of pictures or they were choosing the same kinds of pictures. So that was a real turning point for him, um, you know, kind of coming from this much more fluid milieu. He really wanted more, hence the title of the talk, looking for more. He wanted more out of photography. And he realized he was going to have to do it himself. <laughs> So some of his early series, he, he got his money's worth out of that flag. He did a, his first series that was put together as more than just individual images was uh, using the flag as a metaphor. And then he did a series uh, called the Jan series, working with a, a dancer named Jan. And she was African-American and he uh, was using Jan and the flag to uh, express his, his own feelings about the civil rights movement. And then he did this interesting picture in 1963. He and his wife, Patty, were pregnant with their second child. Um, their daughter was about a month and a half for being born. And Jerry talks about looking at Patty and seeing her as a container. She's the container for this baby. And so he, um, he put up pictures on the wall uh, connected with womanhood and, and girls and uh, so there's some dolls and things and then he posed Patty uh, standing there against the wall and then he mounted the photographs and made them into a little box or I guess the photograph I should say and you see two views of it here uh, so it's a, a four-sided box uh, about the size of a, a toothpaste box 
and um, just, you know, sort of made this interesting one-off little construction. And um, it's a real departure from what we just saw, right? In the family of man. And it's not flat. It's not matted and framed. It's sculptural. And Jerry says he, for, for whatever reason at the time, he just didn't see it for what it was. He didn't see it as a breakthrough, but it did lead to other things uh, and, uh, and to his real contributions to the field, which are very distinctive. Well, in Pasadena, the Pasadena Art Museum was uh, a really, uh, a really happening place for upcoming artists. And you see from the little poster there that a couple of Macmillan's friends and housemates, Joe Good and Ed Ruscha, were showing, um, shown there. And the curator, Walter Hopps, was really a visionary and organized this show, The New Painting of Common Objects. That was a really uh, big deal. So Jerry showed uh, his work to Walter Hopps and was interested in having a show there. And um, Hopps was absolutely on board with it. So that was an exciting um, possibility. But Jerry went home and laid out his work and looked at it and thought about it and really just felt that it was too derivative. And that was exactly the thing that he didn't want to be. So he went back to, to Hops and said, you know, thanks for the opportunity. Can we wait? <laughs> Which is pretty gutsy when you think about it. Uh, but, but it did work out. They, they did end up uh, doing a show of the work uh, a couple of years later. Um, but, um, you know, that was a real critical turning point for, for Macmillan to really um, to figure out a new direction that he thought would be worthy of uh, being shown alongside his friends, for instance, or be worthy of the vision of the museum. And he was trying to think, what could he make? How could he see photography in a new way? Well, he did it. He says he had a big roll of craft paper, you know, that brown paper, like brown paper bags are made out of. And um, he was at the store and he, he saw a paper bag and it made him think of these materials that he had back in the studio. So he went back and he crumpled up the paper and photographed that. And then he decided to make it into a bag. So he used the bag from the store to get the precise dimensions. And he, uh, he printed his photograph and cut and scored and folded it into this shape. He had to kind of hand, he had to hand cut the little uh, sawtooth across the top, like we, we see in manufactured paper bags. And he said, he, he put this thing together and he stepped back and he was elated. He, he really had done something new. He, he said, I, I was so thrilled that it, it was brand new and pristine, but it looked deterior, deteriorated, um, mangled. He, he loved that it wasn't flat, it was an object. And he loved that he had never seen anything like that before. And so he worked with that idea uh, a, a few times. This one is uh, from the same year. He's done a, a bag with the pattern of uh, black eyed peas instead of the crinkled paper. And it's, it's, it has that wit to it in the sense that we can almost sense that we're seeing what's inside the bag. It's a little spatially confusing. But uh, Macmillan talks a little bit about the idea of uh, uh, visual texture, which is something he kind of got from uh, a comment that Irving Penn had made about um, something that he had in his photograph. It's visual texture, but it, it gives it that a little bit extra element um, that he was looking for. And then he took the idea pretty far. He, he was very interested always in just seeing the extent to which he could take the idea and develop an idea. Um, the piece on the left was uh, ostensibly done in, um, in response to 
the negative feedback he was getting from photographers. And he, he talks, I said, who was it that, who was, who was saying negative things about your picture? Who was saying they were photography? And he said, well, it was camera called guys and just people who had seen the work or, or somebody would tell a friend and he'd, he'd hear later, you know, so-and-so says, well, that's not photography. Um, and, you know, why doesn't he just make land, some nice landscapes? So he piled the family in the car and they went up to Northern California and they went to Yosemite and, and Monterey. And so he took some of these luscious, you know, typically pictorial landscapes. And um, because he wanted to show them that it wasn't about the picture, it's about what you do with the picture. So the piece on the left, you see that he, he was always very interested in uh, spatial relationships. And, and some of that comes from uh, Robert Irwin, who he studied with uh, at Chouinard. But here you, you see not only the surface of the bag, but you feel like you're seeing into the bag. And then as you're seeing into the bag, you know, there's that recession of space. And then there's that sort of wonderful burst of, you know, the tears in the bag. Um, so that was kind of his answer to those guys of, you know, yeah, it could be a landscape, but what are you going to, I want more, I'm looking for more. And he did get way down the track, uh, the, the piece on the right, he, he got interested in photo etched copper, which is not a super easy process to make, uh, but this, so this is a, a a copper bag with this kind of photo etching at the top of a, a line of cows. And um, I'm not sure why it's the cow bag, why he made a cow bag, but but I loved it. I think, I think it's hilarious too. It just reminds me so much of uh, going to California and, and people just, people from California just really have no idea about the rest of the country. I went as a junior in college, I transferred to a school in Claremont from Ohio. And people really thought that they were, there must be cows in the street. And I just felt the need to really reassure people that we had indoor plumbing. So, you know, the, guy, the guys from Oklahoma really experienced some of this too when they went. And, you know, they were from a big city, but people thought that they must be cowboys or, you know, maybe that they had a lot of, um, they're very conversant in cow. So, um, <laughs> so there's the cow bag. So Jerry was interested in photography that was dimensional, photography that was non-traditional um, in finding new ways of uh, using images, using photographic images. And on the right, you see uh, a, a little installation of a piece that he did, uh, well, I guess a couple of pieces. He, he photographed a couple of women, a man and a child, and he photographed their torsos. And um, uh, apologies to anybody, uh, there, there's some body parts happen in there. But his idea was that they would be shown next to each other almost a, with a sense of seriality. And um, so he was really interested in that. And so each uh, side of the cube has part of, part of the person's body that he photographed. And um, so he did those in the mid, the mid 60s. And in 19, uh, late 60s, uh, Peter Bunnell was organizing a show for the Museum of Modern Art called Photography and Sculpture. And so uh, he was in California looking, kind of scouting for work and um, using word of mouth to find people. And so he, he had a chance to meet Jerry and to see the, um, the cubes, the, plex, the little plexi cubes here, as well as some of the bags. So uh, he, you know, Jerry was immediately in the show. It fit the subject perfectly. And you see an installation shot of that exhibition at MoMA on the left. And, I think that's uh, Jerry's box, kind of the the lower the lowest hanging one on the kind of center right, and it looks like everything's correctly oriented. He and his wife Patty went to the opening. It was their first trip to New York, and uh, he was not impressed with MoMA. <laughs> he found it very stuffy. He was not really pleased with the fact that the walls were painted mint green, and then. Um, 
as he was there, and, and I think it, it sounds like he was there when, when Peter Bernal was arranging things in the case, um, but he was putting them at angles and, and trying to make it clever, as Jerry says. And uh, Jerry really wanted them to be um, seen straight on. And so he reached over to adjust one and just about lost his arm because, uh, yeah, that's not how we do things <laughs> in museums. <laughs> Peter Bunnell had to say, look, I don't care if you're the artist. You know, you don't, once, once it leaves your studio, it's hands off. So that was a little awkward, but um, it was, uh, a really interesting show, and I just wanted to show you a few other things that were included in the show, just to give you the sense of um, what was happening in the photo world uh, in little isolated pockets. So here are three pieces that were in the sh in this show by Linton Wells, Michael Stone, and um, Michael DeCourcy. So Jerry got a chance to meet some of these folks and uh, some of them were from Los Angeles. So he finally got some community. Uh, Robert Heineken was in the show and uh, is a very iconoclastic artist uh, working with photography. And he was also heading up the, um, the photo program at UCLA. So Jerry got a few teaching gigs through Heineken and then um, ultimately got his um, big teaching job at um, Cal State Northridge, where he spent most of his career. And um, it was an exciting time. And, and it was a really interesting flowering of, of this kind of photography. Um, uh, Mary Statzer has written a very interesting book about the show and some of its ramifications with um, interviews with some of the artists. And it was restaged at a gallery in Los Angeles as part of Pacific Standard Time in 2011 at uh, Cherry and Martin Gallery. So they regathered as many of the pieces as they could. And, um, and then the show did travel to uh, Otis Parsons in Los Angeles. Um, although Jerry says by the time it got there, he felt like things were just kind of a little tired looking and, and that they were they were just kind of over. So, um, and he, he talks about feeling like this kind of photography or this adventurous um, approach to photography was kind of suppressed, you know, suppressed by the art world, suppressed by the market. Um, there was a real shift toward um, more documentary style um, photography of conceptual art happenings and events that just kind of crowded it out. But he kept going. And here are three pieces from the show uh, that are uh, also of a piece with that first self-portrait that I showed you. And here he's continuing to work with the craft paper and uh, cutting things out. And um, it was really important to him. He thought a lot about painting versus photography and he really wanted to make art. And he was really interested in using the camera as a spatial tool. So, but one of, one of the distinctions he felt, he felt that um, photography really hadn't gone through much in terms of abstraction as painting had. And so he wanted to essentially make a picture of something that didn't exist. And that's why he uh, was using these, uh, using the piece of paper, which he saw almost as a kind of an endless field of space and then cutting out uh, a shape, um, which was then dimensional. And then as he says, he was adding the photographic space, which brings it back to being two dimensional. So creating a, a, some ambiguity, but most important to him, creating something that hadn't existed. So he's not photographing something real. And here he chose the, the three states that he uh, has the biggest connection with. Uh, Oklahoma, of course, where he was born and grew up. Uh, California, where he had most of his career and continues to live. And then Texas, which had been um, the home of, uh, of his father's family. And the, 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 the picture of California, we had a print of that at the Oakland, there is a print of that at the Oakland Museum. So when I was there um, during grad school and working with Therese Heyman on a show called Picturing California, we 
we included that. And I just remember looking at that and thinking, who is this guy? You know, I, I just thought it was the, the greatest thing and um, just so inventive. And um, it's really just wonderful to, to have this chance to, to talk about Jerry's work because it really has meant a lot to me over the years. So just to wrap up with a couple of quick examples of more recent work, uh, this is uh, a series, there's a series of uh, three of these in the show. Uh, and there's one that that is, um, um, it was, there were four images originally and I, I, he said he's really having, having trouble finding one. But um, again, he was sort of interested in this idea of the, the field of space and then really interested in the collision of past and present. So he made, uh, these are originally multimedia pieces in which he's done drawings and uh, made a collage and then photographed the piece to create a gelatin silver print with a, a more um, homogenous surface. Uh, but it does have a lot of texture in it. Uh, the, the piece on the right with uh, the Mayan pyramid, for instance, he really saw those little cutouts as almost creating a sense of space in that the one that's big is closer, the one that's small is further away. And then you sort of get, you get this, these wonderful little chunks of texture. And um, he sees that triangle as just kind of bursting through space and time into our contemporary world. So the exhibition OKLA is the first time that these have been shown. So that's really interesting to get a chance to, um, to see some of that work that he began in the 1990s. And then bringing things up to the present, he is working with a colleague to do some pigment prints, some digital work. And so I put one of those that's in the show on the left, right next to some of the earlier work. and. Um, the piece from 2014 that's in the show is, I think, even from this reproduction, just luscious. I mean, that, that color is really rich, and the blue is kind of the blue of the sky. Um, but he's done his, um, his tear along the side of the print there. He's torn the print. And um, the fact that it's in color, I feel like, really gives it a little extra boost because you see that uh, the white where the, the, the pigment is, uh, the white of the paper where the piece has been torn away. And then you get that great little hanging chad of, that you feel like you can almost reach out and touch. And it's so um, spatially confusing in terms of the, the flatness of the two triangles and that color. Uh, but then, you know, he brings it back into three dimensions with that tear. You can see into the space behind it. You know, this is the kind of thing that he really found rich in terms of uh, creating an image. And he, he does talk about that he wasn't trying to create trompe l'oeil, you know, that kind of fool the eye trickery um, that, that we know from painting. Um, that wasn't his intention, but his intention was to create something um, non-objective, so it's not a picture of anything, and it's not a picture of something that exists, although technically he did tear a piece of paper. And, uh, and then also just to reintroduce that photographic space, which brings it back to the flatness. And um, as I said, the other piece on the right is, uh, I love that, that kind of carve, carved quality to that, and the wonderful little tendril coming down when he was working with the craft paper. And I should say, I, you see from this uh, photo caption that um, the, uh, of course he was shooting in black and white at that time. And so he had to add back in toning to make it look like the craft paper. So I think that's kind of hilarious. And uh, this the piece on the right is from the Norton Simon Museum. And they do have a really terrific small group of uh, his, his earlier work. And of course that was the, um, originally uh, the collection was that of the Pasadena Art Museum. So that's a real trove of all things Jerry.
So uh, before we take questions, I just wanted to, to sum up and um, I'm gonna reach for my notes here for a second and just say um, that um, one of the things Jerry said that really impressed me was I'm not interested in making a picture that repre represents reality. <laughs> and he said, I want it to be challenging, but I also want it to be beautiful. So um, I hope you enjoyed seeing this selection of his work and maybe some of you will get a chance to see some things in person. But um, I do really hope what came through is the real strength and innovation of his vision and how he really was able to stick by it and pursue it. And I think some of that really had to do with this, the support of the group of artists that he had known since childhood. So thanks very much. And yeah, Hadley, I'm gonna uh, turn off my screen here and we'll see what people want to talk about. Well, thank you, Kate. That was fantastic. Um, I learned a lot and those images are so compelling. It was really great. I'm going to give people um, some time to go ahead and type your questions in the Q&A box, which you can access. It should probably be at the bottom of your screen. If you can't see a Q&A icon, there are probably three little dots you can click on to access the Q&A box. So you can send your questions to Kate. Um, before we get started with those, Kate, I have a, I have a kind of self-serving question. <laughs> um, and it's because we're about to have a pictorialism exhibit at the- Are you? Okay. And so I just wondered, would it be crazy to consider Jerry as a pictorialist in a sense in that he's manipulating the photographic medium in such a way that it resembles another art form, in this case, sculpture, as opposed to painting? Oh, that's interesting. I don't know what to make of that. <laughs> my, my mind is blown. Um, that is interesting. I think he would say no. Yeah. And you could ask him, but make sure you have an hour. Because <laughs> he's quite a storyteller. <laughs> I think he would really say no because, uh, I mean, I think it's a really interesting way to look at it. Uh, but... Um, he saw himself so much on the on the quest for for non representation, and um, and pictorialism has pictorial in the in the word. So uh, so maybe not. I loved that photograph you showed of the um, well, I guess that construction you showed of the the bag that was ripped open and he had inserted that kind of pictorial image. Oh and inside, which I had <laughs> Yeah, he was pretty mad at those guys. <laughs> for not for saying he wasn't making photographs, but he, you know, he really has some very unkind words for their boring stuff too, so it's only fair. <laughs> okay, well, we do have a couple of, of legitimate questions apart from, <laughs> apart from mine. Let's um, talk about that more later. <laughs> okay, great, and, and please, everyone else, feel free to go ahead and insert your questions in the Q&A box. Um, while we talk. We wondered um, how Jerry fits into your research regarding 60s and 70s mixed media photography. Uh, who else would you? Yeah, I, um, it's something I've always, I've always been, I've been interested in that period. I, I just say it's, it's very odd that I ended up uh, working with photography my whole career because I am so interested in the artist hand and I really got interested in photography through people who use photography and very non-traditional ways. So uh, Maholi and Man Ray, for instance, and their, their photograms and their very flexible view and their very great interest in pushing boundaries. That's really, those are really the things that get me very excited. And so that's what I responded to in Jerry's work. And, but I, I'm, I'm not known for my interest in that. I've certainly built some collections in that way, but, um, I think uh, in a couple of years, we're gonna do a show trying to look at that landscape. There have been a lot of people doing research lately on specific artists. So um, Eastman House just did a, a, a big show and book about um, B. Nettles, who did a lot of alternative process photography um, 
we have a really strong collection in New Mexico of work by Betty Hahn and uh, Tom Barrow, who uh, really looked at photography in very fresh ways. So um, it's still coming together. <laughs> but uh, basically, I want I want to show uh, you know the cool stuff, cool stuff in the collection. Like we've got these these. Uh, uh, faux daguerreotypes made by Betty Hahn out of fabric, you know, and they're stitched and they're, there's gold fabric and I mean, come on. Sounds great. We got, we got, <laughs> <laughs> so when will that show be? Do you have a date for it yet or just? A little bit on the details there, you know, I, 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 I'm going to keep it loose partly because right now the museum's been closed for most of the year. So that does affect the schedule, but I think we're looking at, um, we may be looking at uh, late next year, thereabouts. Yeah, I think it's gonna be called Exploding the Canon, C-A-N-O-N. -N. <laughs> and, it, and it's very analogous to what we were talking about with Jerry with, uh, um, you know, not to, not to be too harsh about uh, the family of man, which is beloved to many, but, um, there was a real split in terms of how people were looking at photography. When, when uh, John Sharkovsky got to MoMA after Steichen, uh, he also had a very camera-based, uh, uh, pre preference for camera-based images. And, um, but there were other people like Nathan Lyons and Peter Bunnell who were uh, interested in and fostering um, more multimedia type approaches to photography. So. That's that. That just seemed uh, like something to take a look at. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, Anna Torok mentioned, "Thank you so much for the fascinating presentation." Um, and she's curious as to whether you think Macmillan's experience in the advertising world affected his photography. Ah, okay. So um, <clears throat> I don't know if uh, if Macmillan worked in advertising per se. I know. Obviously, Patrick Blackwell really did, and uh, Ed Ruscha did a little bit. And uh, Jerry said that he did some book design, and he felt like his visual abilities were really useful to people. And and it also got him some jobs, you know, making author portraits, basically artist portraits. Um, that's I, I I don't know. Um, yeah, there is, a, I mean, there certainly is a really graphic simplicity to his work. And I think I talked about, or meant to talk about the real economy of means that uh, several of the artists in the show seem to share along with that, their wit. Um, and that, that to me makes me think a bit of graphic design and, and advertising and they're very, uh, yeah, some of them are really punchy. So maybe, maybe it was something that kind of uh, he got by osmosis in that group, you know. I don't know what, what else to say about that. That early um, that early portrait you showed, and I can't remember which, if it was, I guess it was Jerry, Mc, or it was, uh, excuse me, Patrick Blackwell in his studio when he was looking, was that right. that photograph where he's looking for the job. And right. I love all the lettering in the background. And then one of the pieces of paper says, help. <laughs> In really large letters. <laughs> Don't we all need that in our offices, Hadley? <laughs> yeah. Some days more than others. <laughs> I know it's just it's just a great picture that you know I I I meant to very go through very carefully and respectfully and talk about all these artists by their last name, which is our historical convention. But you know, gosh, you read the book and 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 read about these guys, and they're just such engaging characters and it's such an amazing time that gets captured in, in the book and in the show and so it, it's just hard not to call them by their first names you know even though I don't really know them. Well you know at least one of them. <laughs> right that's right I have met Jerry and I have met Ed Ruscha but only in passing. <laughs> well um, speaking of someone who probably knows well who does know all of them on a first name basis uh, Mark has asked, what do you see as Jerry's role in the history of photography? Well, it's two questions, really. So how, what do you see as his role in the history of photography? And then also, is there a reason his contribution isn't widely recognized? 
That is interesting. Yeah. So um, as, as Jerry said, anyway, that he really felt like this moment or this motive uh, of, of doing three-dimensional photography was uh, burst forth momentarily and then was eclipsed. And um, he, I, I would, I think he would say, uh, he would say it's, it was a, a failure of imagination <laughs> on the part of the art world and the rest of us probably. Um, I don't know, things get standardized, things get homogenized. I mean, I've always been so intrigued by the, um, the hold that uh, manufacturing has over photography. I mean, that is, its history is the history of technical development, but you know, at some point there were these papers that were this, this size, this size, and this size. And if you wanted your paper already made, that's the size they came in. And, and so most people did that. That was the easiest thing to do. Um, you know, some of it is if you're not thinking about your materials, you can think about your image, your printing, all the other things. You know, you don't have to make the paper anymore. You don't have to make the paper into something anymore. Um, it's a lot of work, <laughs> but, um, but I digress. Um, you know, to me, that's, those are some of the most exciting things, uh, you know, people who've really done something unusual and done something different, but um, it, there's often a mainstream. And if you're not in the mainstream, you're, you're a rivulet out there kind of by yourself. And uh, he may not have been a particularly good promoter for himself. You know, a lot of artists end up teaching. That's a way for them to survive and um, feed their families and um, give back. But it also cuts into their ability to make an exhibit work. And I, I think he's somebody who was always very wary of the art world, capital A art world, and, and it wasn't really that interested in being part of it because he didn't find it very inspiring. I mean, certainly in the photography world. Um, so uh, those may or may not have answered his questions. <laughs> oh my God, the two of you can have a conversation about it when you're back in the building. Um, um, a couple of other questions. Um, Someone asked if his name and the other artists' names were left off of the War Babies photo for fear of repercussions against the artist. Do you have any idea about that? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, they were all just getting started, and you'd think they would have wanted their names on there. And uh, it makes it a lot easier to remember who they are. Um, but uh, it kind of would have ruined it graphically. There's that, arg there's that argument. I don't know the answer to that. Um, if anybody knows that, um, feel free to type it in. Uh, but I think if, if, if they were that concerned, they wouldn't have been putting themselves out there. I mean, obviously they, they were really flouting every convention they could get their hands on. So I would say probably no. But yeah, it's an interesting question, and uh, they didn't come to harm, but uh, but the gallery sure did close. Um, so there, are, we have two other questions, and please feel free to type additional questions if anyone has one. But Lena, Lena asks, were the shadows in the photography and sculpture show at the MoMA intentional? They resembled torsos from the waist down, which really went with the theme of body parts. Oh, that's a good idea. <laughs> that's great. Um, so yeah, you might have noticed, I almost commented on that. That's a great observation um, that because of the plexiglass box mm -hmm. and the way the lights are hitting the objects, you get this really great shadow underneath, this multi-dimensional shadow. And yeah, I actually, um, I live with someone who walks around museums and looks at the shadow underneath the box instead of what's in it sometimes. <laughs> so it makes a great photograph. <laughs> but I love that your observation that it, it makes it look like a torso, but you know, that would have been accidental. But but that's what it, that's that's the great thing about um, visiting art museums is you get to bring all of your own perceptions and and uh, thoughts and experiences to bear on whatever you see. 
Okay, we have one more question from Marilyn. She asked, I heard many of Jerry's photographs were obtained by the Getty. Will we be seeing some of these sometime, or excuse me, will we be seeing these sometime, do you think? Yeah, yeah, I can address that. I um, also just wanted to uh, do a little side note here. Uh, we're hearing from Mark White uh, in regard to the question about uh, the artist names not being on the War Babies poster. And he says, I can see that, I, I can say that Joe Good never cared about repercussions and has always been very candid, sometimes to his detriment. Um, and then uh, Jerry didn't sign a lot of his early work. He was kind of doing work for hire. So that's not super unusual, but but it kind of got lost for a while that he had been the, the one of the author, he had been the photographer. Although I think there was probably a lot of input from from those guys in terms of how they wanted to portray themselves. So yeah, thank you, Mark. So the, the, uh, the Getty Research Institute, I, uh, I'm i not sure if it's uh, the Getty Museum or the Research Institute that has recently acquired a lot of Jerry's work. Um, that's a good question. You might uh, find online, there's a, a video of him uh, with Ed Ruscha and um, I think Patrick Blackwell in a conversation uh, that was part of a show that they did as part of the uh, Pacific Standard Time uh, group of exhibitions a few years ago. And, and that's, that's fun to just listen to them all tell their stories and talk about being young and wild together. And, um, but I don't know that they would do a specific uh, show of his work. Uh, solo shows are pretty unusual especially when you're still alive, which thankfully Jerry is. <laughs> but I do think it's time, and this, this kind of goes back to Mark's question. I, this is a hard thing for some of us to accept, but the 1960s and 70s are now historical periods. <laughs> and the truth of the matter is that the passage of time uh, tends to make it possible to look back and evaluate. And uh, so I do feel like uh, that's part of what we're doing with our, our show at the Museum of Art, New Mexico Museum of Art. And I think we're, start, we're really starting to see people uh, examining that time frame. And um, so I, I'm hoping that this is a chance for, for Jerry's work and his philosophy about photography to be better known. And I, it, it's really wonderful to help be a little bit of a part of that today. I think that I think that um, the show and, and your talk and um, it was refreshing to me to see so many of those photographs that I was you know unfamiliar with before. And They're so different, and he just was just doing his thing. Right. Um, well, I think we're out of questions, so I want to thank everybody for participating today. Um, Oh, and I, I should I should point out Christopher Blackwell thanked you in the chat, Kate. Um, I believe is related to Patrick Blackwell. So thank you for joining us joining us today, Chris. And thank you to everybody for joining our webinar. Um, OKLA will be on view in the museum's records gallery until March seventh. You can also tour it online on our website. So if you're far away, like Kate is, um, you can you can join join us virtually. And I think Amanda will put yeah she has put a link to the to the virtual exhibition in the chat box. Oh, um, great. And we hope you'll join us again on February excuse me on Friday January 29th in two weeks for the next Zoom program held in conjunction with OKLA where OU Art History faculty member Robert Bailey will discuss the work of comedian and musician Mason Williams. And I think that's, it's pretty wow. safe to say that that will be an entertaining wow. treat as well. That should be great. <laughs> Please come back, Kate. <laughs> you, can, you can sign up for that program and other upcoming Zoom programs on the- uh, Yeah, I'll see if I'm allowed to go. <laughs> yeah, I would hope so. <laughs> Um, yeah, and you can get the get the get the book. Get the book. Yeah, thank you for that call out to the catalog. It it is a wonderful catalog, which I think is also it is also available on our website. So, um, everyone, please feel free to to do that. And um, we hope to see you soon. And stay safe and be well. And uh, we'll see you the next time. Thanks, Hadley. <laughs>